it's absolutely essential that universities will need to work closely with industry. Um, it's the key to our recovery from the pandemic, I think, is going to be university industry collaboration. Um, and, and very much it's going to need flexibility. So at THE, um, we've been supporting the global community for 50 years next year. And that support includes great uh, events like this, bringing talented people together to share ideas. Um, and of course, providing data and insight led by our editorial and our consultancy team. So I'm absolutely delighted, sorry for the, the pause in proceedings, that we'll today launch a new report from Times Higher Education's consultancy team, uh, supported by Huawei, uh, offering fresh insights into the dynamic global landscape um, of joint university industry collaboration with some great, great new data and some inspirational case studies, which I hope we can share and uh, deploy to support better, more integrated university industry collaborations. I will now hand over officially to Liz Shepard. She's the Managing Director for Consultancy Services at Times Higher Education. And I'm really excited to, to learn the findings of Liz's new research report, really uh, exciting piece of work. So over to you, Liz, and sorry for that uh, technical hiccup. Thank you very much, Phil. My heart did um, uh, stop for a brief second there, but it was, it was very glad to see you back with us. Um, and thanks for that great introduction, Phil. Um, it's, it's been such an exciting piece of research to undertake. Um, we explored um, several different techniques, seven different data, um, all of which are presented in the report that will be shared by um, our wonderful Times Higher Education Summits team um, at the close of today's summit. Um, I'm gonna share some highlights. I hope everyone can see um, just a few, few slides I'm going to run through um, for the next few minutes. Um, we began our investigation um, with some incredibly familiar data that Times Higher Education has been working with since, 2000 and, um, since 2010 and the, the, the methodology of the world university rankings. And um, here we began by looking at the, the 13th metric um, um, that's uh, included in the world university rankings that focuses on understanding um, research income from industry. This is an important part of the rankings methodology. It's an important part of our analysis when we, um, when we look at the over 1,500 universities that are included in the 2021 world university ranking. So first up, we tried to understand um, uh, and we tried to measure the relationship between um, ranking position um, and um, income from industry. And hopefully you can see on the screen in front of you the, the first bar chart that shows that unsurprisingly, um, there was a clear relationship between the, the bands in the ranking, the top 200 institutions, the 201 to 300 band and so on and so forth. And the, the median um, research income from industry per academic staff. So that familiar measure that is included within the world university ranking. Um, we then went on, went on to try to understand the, 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 ge the geographic distribution of those institutions. And um, uh, at the, the, the second um, um, uh, table um, that's presented at the bottom of this slide shows the highest ranked institutions by country. So looking at those top 200 institutions that have the highest median um, income from industry per academic staff, we look at the, the, the constitution of that top 200 group unsurprisingly, and I'm sure very familiar to the, um, to the audience of today's summit, the largest number of universities within that top 200 group are from the United States, followed by the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and indeed France. Um, when we look in more details, and this data is presented in the report, um, universities um, that the highest ranked institutions, Oxford, Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. When we look at the, the, um, the, the in real terms, the financial contributions that they receive um, from industry to support their research efforts. Obviously, um, we can uh, understand from that data that these universities are attracting the highest volume um, in real terms of income um, from industry. However, 
what we wanted to begin to um, understand was um, across these six countries who feature the, the largest proportion of universities within uh, the World University Rankings Top 200, the six countries um, uh, of the Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, the United States, France, and the UK. We began to explore, um, as it says in the, in the bar chart at the top of the screen, research income from industry as a proportion of the total research income um, across each of these countries. And we began to understand that the Netherlands does indeed have the largest proportion of research income from industry as a proportion of the total research income received by all institutions from the Netherlands within that top 200 group. So again, this was uh, data that we could analyze via the world university rankings. Within the report, um, we were able via our fantastic data scientists here at Times Higher Education, able to explore some additional bibliometrics. Um, these additional bibliometrics um, analyzed via the Microsoft Academic Graph allowed us to layer on top of this understanding of the percentage of academic publications across these six countries that were uh, carried out with commercial collaborators. And again, the bar chart that you can see on the, the bottom of the screen in front of you shows, um, again, uh, the uh, incredible uh, contribution of industry, not only financially to universities within the Netherlands, but also when it comes to collaborative research production. Institutions within the, ne within the Netherlands, year on year, we can see uh, the trend, the upward trend with a little bit of a wobble uh, between 2015 and 2019, the period um, across the report that our data was analysed, we can see institutions in the Netherlands producing a far higher proportion of publications with commercial collaborators than any other of the six countries featured within this analysis, far more than institutions in France, Switzerland, Germany, the UK, and indeed the United States. So taking a flip side, uh, we'd looked at um, commercial collaborations, um, industry income, um, across those six institutions, we wanted to add an additional layer of understanding who these, um, who these industry collaborators are, what their contribution is and how this can be measured. And this data is, um, uh, um, uh, it's, it's often um, uh, commercially uh, confidential information, particularly where industry is collaborating with institutions on projects of different nature. So often, um, um, a, a, a measure used to explore um, investment by, for example, top tech companies that we can see on the screen here. We look at um, research and development expenditure um, as a proxy measure for understanding investment in uh, tertiary education, higher education research by organizations of this kind. And if we look at this data produced, um, focusing specifically on 2000 and 18, we can see that Alphabet, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the parent, now parent company of Google in 2018 had the highest overall R&D expenditure and indeed um, one of the highest um, levels of R&D intensity, um, which is um, uh, a measure of the, uh, the percentage of total revenue spent on research and development. This was followed by the likes of Samsung, Microsoft, and of course, Huawei. Um, when we look again, and this is the additional layer of analysis that we were able to provide, when we look at the, um, not only the investment in research and development, but also the contribution of these tech companies to co-authored academic publications, um, we found some really interesting, uh, interesting insights that, that between the, the, the period analyzed, 2015 to 2019, Microsoft followed by Google, Huawei, and indeed Samsung produced an extraordinary amount of academic publications in collaboration with institutions. So these figures show the total number of co-authored academic publications produced by these top tech giants um, around the world. Um, this insight um, uh, is incredibly um, uh, useful. Um, but what we went on to do, and as Phil said 
um, at the beginning of uh, the, uh, the session, um, we wanted to provide um, and analyze in more qualitative detail some case studies of the types of collaborative relationships that exist between top tech companies and universities around the world. And I highlight here just two examples that are taken from the report. Um, the first focusing on um, a collaboration um, between Samsung and the University of Stanford, obviously in the United States. And what our analysis has allowed us to do, looking specifically uh, within the bibliometrics, looking at examples of these um, incredible collaborative projects that have been carried out um, by tech companies supporting universities around the world, we can see, um, I think I'd like to highlight two things. We can see that not only is this research um, of incredibly uh, high quality, um, it's cited um, uh, significantly um, by uh, the academic community um, globally, but of, of incredible interest when we look at the types of collaborations that are being undertaken by top tech companies top te tech companies and universities around the world, we can see the breadth of collaborators. Um, so not only are um, uh, top tech, tech companies and universities um, collaborating uh, bilaterally, but also in many cases, including um, other companies um, who are collaborating on those similar initiatives um, and also other universities, other universities from completely different um, corners of the world who come together um, in these incredible trilateral, multilateral partnerships to produce some of the best and most high quality research that is forwarding um, these uh, disciplines specifically here, um, thinking about um, computer science, material science and engineering. So I hope um, some, uh, some really interesting insights have been provided by um, this report that we, we're really happy to, to share with all uh, delegates from uh, today's event. Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much, Liz. That was a whirlwind tour of the report, um, but incredibly helpful. So just to be absolutely clear, um, the report is available to download on this platform. Um, in the resources hub. So if you go into the lobby, you can see the, the resources section and you can download the report there. Uh, we'll also make it available to all participants of the event. But I suggest, Liz, I don't know if uh, how much you're going to be live and available, but the, the THE consultancy team does have a stand in the exhibition area. So I would say anyone who has any questions uh, for Liz or for her team about the research, about the, the, the insights from this report, please do head over to the THE um, consultancy exhibition booth and you can join the chat, uh, ask questions through chat or set up um, meetings if you want to explore this data further. But that was a lightning tour. Go and read the report, reflect on it. And uh, you can certainly uh, approach myself and Liz through the exhibition booth, through the, um, the platform for Q&A. Um, but for now, I'm wrapping up because we've got more exciting sessions to come on this stage. I'm really excited about THE campus, a new um, open community resource for sharing best practice on teaching and learning, which we'll be talking about in a moment or two. Uh, but for now, thank you very much indeed, Liz.